Okay. So on behalf of the LaRouche Political Action Committee, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. My name is Dennis Speed, and this is our Saturday web uh, dialogue with Lynn and LaRouche. Uh, Lynn will not be with us today. We're going to begin with the same thing that some of you may have seen last night if you watch the webcast. This is an excerpt from a 1997 speech that Lynn gave in Washington, D.C. This at the occasion of our release of the 1997, the Eurasian Land Bridge, the New Silk Road uh, Locomotive for World Economic Development report. So we're going to play that, and that will be followed by an opening statement by Diane, and then we'll go from there to questions and answers. There are two nations of respectable power. One is the United States, and the United States, not as represented by the Congress, but by the president. It is the identity of the United States which is the political power, not the concatenation of its The United States is represented today only by the president as a political institution. The Congress does not represent the United States. They're not quite sure who they do represent these states. Since they haven't visited their voting these days. The president is institutionally the embodiment of the United States in international relations. The State Department can't do that. The Justice Department can't do it. No other department can do it. Only the president of the United States of our Constitution can represent the United States as an entity. It's time entire personality. It's truly, it's whole people. Now, there's only one other power on this planet which can be so insolent as that toward other powers, and that's the Republic of China. Our China is engaged presently in a great infrastructure building project in which my wife and others have had an ongoing engagement over some years. It's a great reform in China, which is a troubled reform. They're trying to solve a problem. It doesn't mean there is no problem. And then they find us all. Therefore, if the United States, so the President of the United States and China, participate in fostering that project, sometimes called the Silk Road Project, sometimes the Grand Bridge Project, if that project of developing uh, the other projects across the region, into Africa, into North America, is extending, that project is enough work to put this whole planet into an economic divide. And I'll get into a bit of that, which would make it more sensuously concrete. Now, China has had cooperation with the government of Iran for some time. Iran has actually been completing a number of railways with the extension of China's language program, or so called project. More recently, we had on the side of India, from Indian leadership, which has met with the representatives of China, to engage in an initial group among the land routes for land reform. One goes into Kumi in China. And that was in that area was in, in uh, Mishima during the part of World War II. When we were out of Mishima, we had planes flying into Kumi over the Humphrey, they used to say in those days. And I'm quite familiar with that. But if you have uh, water connections, like canal connections, and rail, and rail connections from Kumi to Michigan, that area, across Bangladesh, into India, across to Pakistan, into Iran, up to the area just above Tehran, Tehran, south of the Caspian. You have linked to the Middle East, you have linked to Central Asia, you have linked to Turkey, you have linked to Europe. Then you have another route, which is pretty much the same, the route of the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad, which is built under American influence. 
and now being part of Russia. Now we're moving, which is being developed in several regions, with China and Iraq. India is working on a plan which involves only a few hundreds of kilometers of rail to be added. So a lot of improvements along the right way. Which will move the area north of Tehran, to Pakistan, to India, to Bangladesh, to Myanmar, into Kuwait, into Thailand, into Vietnam, down to Malaysia and Singapore, across the Straits by a great bridge, into Indonesia. There's a plan also for the development of a railway to what is northern Siberia, across the Bering Straits, into Alaska, and down into the United States. There's a Middle East link, a several weeks, from Europe as well as in China, but from China, Middle East link, into Egypt, into all of Africa. So that what we have here is a set of projects which are not just transportation projects like the Transcontinental Railroad of the United States, which was the precedent for this idea back in the late 1960s, 1860s and 1870s. But you have development corridors where you develop on an area of 50 to 70 kilometers either side of your rail and your pipeline and so forth. You develop this area with industry, with, with mining, with all these kinds of things, which is the way you pay for a transportation network. Because of all the rich economic activity, every few kilometers of distance along this link, there's something going on, some economic activity. People working, people building things, people doing things. To transform this planet in great projects of infrastructure building, which will give you the great industries, the new industries, the new agriculture, and the other things we have to need. There is no need for anybody on this planet who is able to work to be out of work. That's it. And that project is means. If the nations which agree with China, which now includes Russia, Iran, India, other nations, if they engage in a commitment to that project, which they're building every day, if the United States, that is the President of the United States, Clinton, continues to support that effort as he's been doing, that is political. Then what do you have? We have the United States and China and a bunch of other countries ganged up together against the greatest power of this planet, which is the British Empire, called the British Commonwealth. That's the end. And if on one bright day, say a Sunday morning after a weekend meeting, the President of the United States, the President of China, and a few other people say, we have determined this weekend, that based on our advisors and facts, that the international financial monetary system is hopelessly bankrupt. And we, in our responsibility as heads of state, must put these bankrupt institutions into bankruptcy reorganization in the public interest. And it is in our interest to cooperate as nations in doing this, to avoid creating chaos on this planet. The result then is that such an announcement on a bright Sunday morning will certainly spend the top of heads in Washington TV. Otherwise, it means that the entire system is at that moment have been put through the guillotine and the head is rolling down the tree. I don't need to answer that question. That means we have at that point the impetus for building immediately a new financial and monetary system. Now, in building, putting a corporation which is bankrupt into viable form, what do you do? You've got to find the business that it's going to do, which is the basis for creating enough credit to be able to get that fund going again. A language program with its implications on a global scale is a great project which spins off directly and indirectly enough business, so to speak, for every part of this world to get this world back on a sound basis again. I would just suggest that everyone that has various forms of access to uh, contacts via internet, whatever that form may be, should post this. Post this and begin or initiate a discussion with everyone you know now about that conception, because as we enter the period of September, there will be the drive for that conception 
which is going to inform everything that we're going to be doing. Uh, and that'll become, I think, relatively evident as we get into both the discussion now and some of the discussion at the conclusion of today's dialogue. So to give us our opening statement, let me present Diane Sayre of our policy committee of the LaRouche Political Action Committee. Good afternoon. Uh, so since that, nearly 20 years ago, in the last two weeks, two extraordinary new corridors of the land bridge have been opened. And unfortunately, most Americans are not even aware that this is occurring. That is the world that Lyndon LaRouche was talking about 20 years ago is at our doorstep. Uh, one is the Dalian, I don't know if you, that's the right pronunciation, China to Moscow route, which is a route that takes 11 and a half hours by airplane. So it's rather long, uh, has just been opened. Sorry, and it, uh, it's a 10 day, they sent the first refrigerated freight train, which carry, can carry fruits and vegetables since it's refrigerated from uh, China, from Dalian, China, which is way far out on the Western side of China to Moscow. And then the other corridor is another major Chinese city into Warsaw, Poland, the first freight train left for there about two days ago. So these corridors that are shown on the map are being completed. It's not even that they're just being done, they're actually being completed. As we sit here in the United States, wondering if you can get across the cross Bronx without losing half of your car in a pothole, um, <clears throat> it's worth thinking about. The other thing I wanted to just express is we're getting a very interesting shift reported across the country, which is that Americans are waking up to the idea that the election is a complete fraud and they're not interested in it anymore. And if you do meet that rare individual who is supporting either of the two, um, at least the current candidates, uh, you should definitely simply laugh. Oh, you're supporting Hillary Clinton? <laughs> oh, you're supporting Donald Trump? <laughs> it's a joke. No need to take it seriously. Uh, it means nothing. China, Russia, India, these nations combined and the hundred or so nations that have been swept into the one belt and one road vastly outweigh the United States in terms of population, in terms of resources, etc. So our job here is as Alexander Hamilton had his job from the center point of Manhattan is to bring the United States into partnership with this new paradigm, which Lyndon and Helga Zepp LaRouche have been fighting for for 40 years. And it is absolutely possible, uh, in spite of the fact that the so-called candidates are complete criminal morons. Uh, for example, as people may know, Glass-Steagall, which is the first step in organizing a recovery and doing what Mr. LaRouche said here 20 years ago, in effect declaring this derivatives gigantic bubble bankrupt, is in the platform of both the Democratic and Republican parties. That is not because the presidential candidates are intelligent enough to know what it means or to support it. It's because there is a sense in the population which we have fought for, people in this room, have been fighting for years to get Glass-Steagall back through state legislatures, their labor unions, et cetera, and it was simply impossible for them to keep it off the platform. Similarly, we waged a fight starting several years ago for the 28 pages in the 9-11 Commission report. President Obama was forced to release those pages. How likely was that? Is that because President Obama wants to implicate his friends in Saudi Arabia and 9-11? No, he has no intention of doing that, but he could not avoid releasing the pages because of two factors, what we have done and what President Vladimir Putin did 
almost exactly one year ago where he first visited China on VJ Day, on the 70th anniversary of the victory in Asia, where they had a spectacular display of power in terms of the military technology which marched through the streets on that day. And then Putin came here to the United Nations General Assembly and called for a coalition to fight terrorism. Precisely what he was calling for when the monument, which is on the front of the posters advertising the series of 9-11 Memorial Requiem concerts was dedicated. He was saying the same thing, that there should be a coalition to fight terrorism. And the fact that he intervened and he did so successfully in Syria created a white backdrop for Obama's criminal behavior in supporting and funding ISIS and Al-Qaeda and created the conditions where he could not but release the 28 pages. So in thinking, in our acting in this period, it is crucial that Americans lift themselves above the slime and the garbage of our day-to-day -day culture. Friedrich Schiller said, live in your time, but be not of it. That is, we in this room and those listening to this webcast on the LaRouche Pack site have to present reality to our fellow Americans from above because it is the dynamic that is shaping up in the new paradigm which will act actually give us the way to restore the United States to the principles intended by Alexander Hamilton. And the last thing that I, I just want to say is if if Ron Chernow's biography can be believed, uh, he says that Hamilton expressed a very grave concern that the Constitution which he created would work very well when the United States was young and when people were optimistic and future-oriented, but he worried what would happen to the Republic if the population were to become corrupted and jaded. And I think that is a concern for us as well, which is why we, one, are producing this newspaper, The Hamiltonian, and the tradition of Hamilton's Federalist Papers to mobilize and uplift the thinking of the population of New York City. And two, why the Schiller Institute Chorus has joined and is participating in a series of performances of the Mozart Requiem which at their completion will have brought in probably three or 4,000 people or more from the New York metropolitan area and dozens of people participating in the chorus, which will have a transformative effect on the culture of this area, which is required for us to actually secure the victory that is now very near to our reach. So that's what I wanted to put on the table and I imagine people have many thoughts on this. Uh, just before we start our questions and answers, and people can line up for that, I'd just like to call attention, given uh, Diane's reference to Schiller, uh, to something that Jason Ross said last night, because live in your time, but be not of it. Jason said last night, and I think you should take a look at that webcast, Leibniz, Leibniz had already shown that the no, Newtonian idea of space and time was wrong. It has the result that people think of facts, of things taking place in locations at certain times. But Einstein showed that this actually is not true, that there is no time that any event takes place. That the time an event occurs depends on who is looking at it, not in the way of uncertainties or anything like that, but the time itself doesn't exist as one thing that's independent of who's doing the looking or of their location. What he did was he created a new concept that resolved the contradiction between two concepts that were actually mutually contradictory. Okay, why don't we go to the first question and answer. Uh, I have 
Uh, two questions, one of which was just called in by Rick from Bergen County, who could not be here. Uh, Rick saw the webcast last night and emphasized from what Lyndon said in this video that you've just shown, Lynn's point that uh, there's no need for anyone to be without work based on the unfolding of this program that Lynn was putting forward there. Rick said, in looking, in considering that, in looking over the four principles, LaRouche's four laws, that when you look at the job market of the United States at this point, he said this is especially relevant to young people, that you've got many jobs, millions of jobs, which pay $12 an hour or thereabouts. Piecework, independent contractors, the employer has no obligation to the worker. He said the position of labor in the United States is very bad. Uh, so these jobs are not adequate to live on. He said $12 is an insult. I know people living in these conditions. And his question on this was, will people be able to get jobs and careers that will enable them to live under the condition of these four principles being implemented? So I want to why don't you take that, and then I'll come to the second. One thing about that. Uh, uh, once upon a time, there were Americans that implemented what Alexander Hamilton so talked about. And I think if, if you just think back to what we just saw from Lynn, both the energy, the clarity, and the mastery of the conception that he put forward there in 1997, partially because he had invented the idea, uh, that that is the first, the, 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 the standpoint from which we have to take up a question like this. Everything that is happening to the American workforce and has happened to the American workforce since uh, August 15th, 1971 has been an insult. I mean, there's been 45 years of nonstop insults. Uh, but the problem involved is uh, related to something that I believe Keisha Rogers brought up last night, which is that if you think that you can only do what you already know to be possible, then you are not free. If you think you can only do what you know now assumed to be possible, you are not free. You have no idea what being free is. You don't even have an idea what being human is. This, I think, is important because when people talk about this idea of labor, they have a very peculiar idea. They either think about uh, uh, physical manual labor or they think about blue collars or they think about, you know, they have various kinds of, uh, kinds of notions of it. When uh, back in 1974 and 1975, uh, LaRouche first developed his International Development Bank proposal and when he then ran for uh, president in 1976, 40 years ago, in his first campaign, uh, when people would talk to him about who do you think is going to vote for you, he said, I already have two billion votes from around the planet. That was always his conception. And back in those days, that campaign, as some people know, was run as United States Labor Party. And that campaign had a particular logo, which was a giant tractor very advanced tractor. But the conception was that what Lynn was doing and what we were doing as an organization was we were redefining uh, something that became more evident in the two years following. It was the work that we did uh, on Henry Charles Carey's ideas, uh, and specifically the idea of the harmony of interests, that there is no necessary class war that must be fought between so-called labor and so-called capital. But the problem with addressing the problem, the situation from that standpoint, is it would deflect completely from what I think I, Lynn has got, gotten at around Einstein. The problem with the question is not the question. The problem is to understand that the American people for 45 years walked away. There's virtually nobody productive in the United States. There, there are perhaps 13% or thereabouts of our people that are productive in any way. 
everything else that is being done in our economy is non-productive. And non-productivity is now the legacy or the, the condition of two full generations of Americans who barely know what productivity even means. The issue of Einstein, as I understand what Lynn is trying to get at it, and this doesn't mean this is what Lynn is saying, I, I'm just in, responding this way, is as he keeps emphasizing, creativity does not come from babies as such. It comes from the idea of seeking to preserve conditions in which genius among young people supersedes the conditions of the society and of their parents. And labor, as we actually understand it, is not a matter of a skill uh, or let's say what we call infrastructure development or any of those things, not any of that. It's a completely different kind of idea. And, 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 and there are ways in which we can implement it which are dramatic. What Lynn went through, of course, in his 1997 speech was very dramatic. And I think that the important thing for us to look at for the American pop people is the Hamiltonian idea, a single America. Notice that what Lynn said is that only the President of the United States actually has the authority to deploy the United States on behalf of the American people. There is no other entity that can do that. Well, of course, we are talking about a new presidency which does not include Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, or frankly, it would have also not included Bernie Sanders, does not include Jill Stein, and doesn't include, what's that guy, Barrett Johnson, whatever his name is? Garrett, it doesn't include any of those people. It's, it's a new presidency which we're campaigning for right now, for November, that includes none of that. So, so how is that real? How is that a real conception? I think you just saw it expressed in what he said in 1997, and you see it expressed in Vladimir Putin, and you see it expressed in what the Chinese are doing. So I, I would just try to make people clear that Lynn's Manhattan Project is about exactly this question um, of, of establishing an entirely new basis for the, for the human race to change its whole relationship to the creative process and therefore to work as a whole and the United States in specific has its destiny wrapped up in what these events are going to be uh, in the next three weeks uh, and what's going to happen at the United Nations and what it is we are as a Manhattan Project can make happen. Well, you've partly answered the second question. I want to bring people's attention in. You may or may not have picked up at the table the announcement of the Schiller Institute conference Saturday, September 10. Uh, and it, the conference invitation begins, the world today stands at a crossroads. Poet Friedrich Schiller referred to such an inflection point as a punctum zalians, a branching point. What I think would be valuable would be uh, to elaborate a bit how Lynn and Helga are thinking about the punctum zalians of this moment of history and how we of the Manhattan Project are deploying to carry, to achieve a, uh, an advance for civilization in this punctum zalians. Well, I want to say something that takes up both questions. Because um, in this question of what Rick was asking, that there's no need for anyone to be unemployed, there is a question of evil. There is a question of intent to do harm. Uh, in other words, to enslave and immiserate and murder billions of people when in the physical universe there is no necessity of that, that the option for everyone to reach their full potential as a human being exists. And the way that this comes about, if you think about why does he keep talking about Bertrand Russell? How did Bertrand Russell become an evil man? Why is Bertrand Russell the most evil man of the 20th century? Because what Bertrand Russell's idea of deductive logic, that you cannot be creative, that you cannot have an idea 
uh, that is not that the only things that are acceptable, and this is uh, this is all over our academic institutions, is that you can't say something is true unless you can start at this point and prove this and this and this, and you get to your conclusion based on so-called facts that you already know. That's what a computer does. That's why people may remember the, I think it was the Class A Mercedes some years ago, they're doing benchmarking. We can't afford to do real tests and discover that perhaps there are things going on in the universe that we have not yet apprehended. Uh, so they had a car which they only tested on computer synthesized drive tests and discovered once they produced the automobile that when you tried to turn a corner at going 35 miles an hour faster, the car overturned. Um, now, the way that the human mind works is that we are capable of forming a hypothesis about the nature of the universe, about the nature of God's relationship to the universe and, and a creative principle which perhaps we have not discovered. So if you take the work of Johannes Kepler, he was able to hypothesize a model for the relationships between the distances of the planetary orbits, both from the sun and from each other, which corresponded to a, a model of harmonic proportions and necessitated something where the asteroid belt was discovered later. This was not based simply on observations taken by Tycho Brahe, but it was based on a conception of a principle of order in the universe that was apprehendable to the human mind. When, when you decide that that doesn't exist, that we can only do, this is the nature of pragmatism, that you can only do anything based on what's been done before, as Keisha was saying, as was just referenced, that is actually evil. That is an assault on what it means to be a human being as opposed to an animal. Everyone can think of animals, your favorite pet. As much as they might be delightful, they probably have not started doing new things, even if you have been an absolute genius in the way you have raised your puppy or your kitten. Chances are they're not cooking dinner, they're not doing the dishes, they haven't learned how to drive, although I did read that someone's trying to get dogs to drive. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's been very successful. Um, <clears throat> they certainly haven't designed spaceships or figured out how to get, uh, how to like, Dogs haven't figured out how to produce their own cattle or anything like that. They're, they're living in the same mode that they had for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. Hum, human beings, on the other hand, in spite of various dark ages that have come our way, have actually been able to hypothesize states of existence which are a leap beyond anything we did before and you cannot construct a linear step, stepwise motion as to how you got there. And I think this is crucial when you talk about the, the divide between Zeus on the one hand and Prometheus on the other hand, whereas Zeus and the gods of Olympus said that mankind is not to have knowledge, but it's not knowledge of facts, it's a knowledge of, of creativity, it's an ability to be creative. And Prometheus, defeated Zeus, and I think part of what's very important in the story, which often gets let, left out, is various emissaries came to Prometheus and said, why don't you apologize to Zeus? Why don't you admit that, that you, were, you, know, you were out of line, and maybe you can make a deal with Zeus and he will be merciful? And Prometheus said no, that Zeus himself will be destroyed because actually the universe functions in an ever-developing manner, which is why the way that the human race survives is not to, rem there is no such thing as sustainable growth or sustainable development, but that we 
can only survive, which is a horrible way of thinking of it, through growth. And what's happened now is that you have a large, in fact, the majority of the world's population has decided to act according to natural law and to principles of the universe and fight for growth. And you have a bankrupt remnants of a British empire, which is what Wall Street, the FBI, the Obama, the Bush administrations, what we've seen here, which is thoroughly bankrupt and is going to collapse. And all they can do is try and threaten war against Russia and China, against the nations that are leading this growth. And they can't even deliver. The only thing they could maybe deliver is a nuclear weapon, which is why it's so dangerous. We, we do not have the economy to sustain a ground war. Uh, the Russians were correct when they pointed out that the 40,000 NATO troops and exercises on the borders of Russia were only a bluff. They were a cover for a potential launch of a nuclear strike because we have no capability. We're bankrupt. We're done. We're, we're finished. So I think it's very obvious in a sense which way to go. Uh, LaRouche is optimistic that we're actually on the brink of a major victory. And uh, the challenge of what we're doing in the United States is to bring this potential to the American people, which is what will become evident at the conference on September 10th. Uh, and these people who will be speaking there are people who are in a sense speaking to us from the new paradigm, but also to get us to wake up and become a little more vigorous, that we cannot be complacent. And when you're confronted with something which is evil, which has a commitment to evil, it is not acceptable to say, well, this is the new normal, but to say that this is going to be stopped and we're going to act so that evil does not dictate American policy. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Matthew Sweet, and I'm from London, which perhaps in this context requires a bit of uh, explanation or an apology or something like that. I can assure you, you know, that I haven't been sent on some secret mission from uh, Her Majesty, to my knowledge, at least. Um, uh, no, I won't. No, I, pro I promise I won't do that. Um, I'm, I'm really just passing through and, and wanted to kind of show my interest in, in what you were doing here. I, I, I'm here to, I'm doing some research, and I was at the, the Swarthmore Archive looking at the Peace Collection, and Margaret, who I was sitting next to there, who helped me stumble through Mozart's Requiem, tells me, Dennis, that you're an uh, alumnus of, uh, of uh, 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 Swarthmore. Am I too far away? Okay, sorry, is that better? I can speak from the diaphragm. Um, so my question really is related to... Um, something I was reading on the LaRouche Pack website uh, recently um, when the Panama Papers came out um, and Mr. LaRouche identified that release of, of information as a, a, as, a, as a British operation, a kind of strategy of some sort against Vladimir Putin. Um, and then a few days later, I read a piece um, that was written by uh, Clifford Gaddy of the Brookings institution, um, arguing almost exactly the opposite, really. And in looking at that, I realized that he was a former member of this uh, uh, organization who I think, I think kind of looked after things in Sweden uh, for you. So my question is really just about trying to draw those two lines and thinking together and why you think that contradiction is there. And perhaps you might say something about Mr. Gaddy's views and perhaps about, about him as well. Well, just on the latter, part of that question, I happen to have been present in 1984 in March in Stockholm at a discussion that occurred between Cliff Gaddy and uh, Bill Jones, who now directs our work in China. And they were talking about their various family backgrounds. And uh, they'd both come to Sweden during the anti-war movement. And so uh, Cliff's uh, family's from Virginia, and Bill has a different background, and they were going back and forth, and 
Bill had this to say about Cliff. He said, well, Cliff, my family fought for the United States when it counted. Um, Cliff, and when you bring that up and you bring up these other things, uh, Lynn has been very clear. And over the years, our experience with British intelligence, uh, when Lynn got out of jail, in fact, one of the things he had us do, several of us, was we had a panel called the Palmerston Multicultural Zoo. And uh, what he had us do was to describe to the American audience how Lord Palmerston designed a policy of empire during the 19th century, and particularly during the period of the 1850s, specifically that period around the Crimean War and so on. And I just want to quote something that we pointed out uh, that Palmerston said about Russia. Uh, just get it, ah, here it is. Two things, actually. The best and most effectual security for the future, future peace of Europe would be the severance from Russia of some of the frontier territories acquired by her in later times. Georgia, Circassia, the Crimea, Bessarabia, Poland, and Finland. And he went on to say, the policy and practice of the Russian government has always been to push forward its encroachments as far and as fast uh, as the apathy or want of firmness of other governments would allow it to go. But always to stop and retire when it was met with decided resistance. Now, the Chechen policy that we've seen, the terrorist policy coming out of Chechnya, and particularly from the time of 1999, when Mr. LaRouche released a two-hour video called Storm Over Asia, beginning with Chechnya. Chechnya. Uh, from that point, Vladimir Putin's emergence in Russia uh, and his successful countering of that operation has marked a period from, from which uh, LaRouche and Putin have been on a sort of parallel track. They have not met or had a discussion but this issue of the deeper British roots, both culturally and specifically on the issue of terrorism. You know, we, if you know our material, you know that we wrote something a long time ago uh, saying that London should be investigated as the center of world terrorism. It's a long report we did. So we know about this, and we know about the way in which the issue of Russia and the issue of what Putin is doing now, this is the core threat to the British East India Company's 1763 rule of the planet from now until, from then until now. The United States was an important process in countering that, but LaRouche and his organization were designed to finish that battle against the British Empire. What you see coming out of Russia, what you see coming out of China, these are policies that have been in discussion with those two nations and many other nations as well, but those two nations adopted policies which LaRouche invented. These are anti-British imperial policies which should have been adopted by the people of the United States but weren't. And LaRouche not being one to wait for others to um, adopt the truth, successfully campaigned, specifically through his wife Helga, when he was in jail, to create a policy, which is, we have various names, Eurasian Land Bridge, many other names. And so the issue of Putin, the issue of Russia, the issue of China, the issue of what we are talking about about this, this is, the revenge of Alexander Hamilton. And we don't um, automatically condemn you for your origins, <laughs> but, but we, would, we would wish that you might think through the deeper importance 
of what is actually happening and what we are about to see happen also at the G20 summit and some of the other things that particularly Mrs. LaRouche has been involved in. Now, that's all available on the website and the long reports, other things you can get for that. Um, but I, I, I gave a, a long answer there, maybe too long, but the reason I thought it's important is the final death of the British Empire is about to occur. And we are going to be very happy about that when we're responsible for it. Let's see, uh, good afternoon. Um, last week, Dennis uh, read, asked Lynn a question on my behalf. And uh, in thinking about Lynn's response, I wanted to, uh, this is all, we're, staying uh, on the subject, on the topic of Einstein, I thought it'd be good to uh, continue that. I've not seen last night's webcast, and I see the front of the cover of EIR, the Einstein era. So also, uh, we've got a conference coming up. So uh, between now and then, I should hopefully learn some things, but I wanted to bring some more things up on this. There were two things in Lynn's response that uh, I wanted to bring up again for discussion. The first was how he, uh, that Einstein step by step uh, increasingly understood what was wrong with the way the people of the world consider how the world, how the world works. So I see this young man going through this process into adulthood. It was a step by step process. So I, I found that interesting uh, in terms of how he thinks. But more importantly, that he dared to, which, you know, obviously then implies great courage, great courage to make the charges that had to be made in order to engineer what mankind can do to save the development of the human species. Uh, so this daring, this courage, this quality of mind that first understands and then takes that charge forward, uh, you know, obviously, going under great attack for uh, much of his life, even today for those that misunderstand, misunderstand him, that claim to be, as Lynn said, you know, so-called followers and admirer of his. So those two things I wonder if we could uh, discuss and elaborate on a little further. Uh, yeah, we'd like to bring Phil to the uh, to the microphone to say something about the Einstein question. Phil, can you? Yeah, you stay right there. Oh well, I mean, first of all, I think you know. Uh, there's no short answer to this. I think, you know, Lynn wants to provoke a certain kind of thought. And I'm not, I'm not saying that he's just being provocative. He's basically saying there's a standard of creativity uh, that he's talking about that we have to think in terms of, in terms of what we're doing politically today. We, what we want is the equivalent of a complete change in the conception of space-time. That, and that, that, that's not just a phrase. I, I'm, I, there's a perfect case I'm not sure that, I, uh, that we know the, the answer to. We're looking for something for which we probably don't have the vocabulary. It's not in the language. It's just like there's all kinds of things uh, that we've lost in language, the subjunctive mode. Uh, a lot of the peculiar characteristics of Greek, for example, the, the number of modes and modalities that have been lost, for example, you know, in the, in the idea that hip hop is sort of creative or something, or if you're really enraged, then you're totally creative. Uh, so um, the, uh, there's nothing I can do briefly, but I can say th that Einstein does represent, even though, you know, there are various things that have been said over time, Einstein does represent a truly creative person who fought, and part of the creativity 
was the fight. So for example, it's well known that after the middle of the 1920s and beginning in the middle of the 20s, uh, Einstein completely opposed some of what Dennis was referring to, this uh, indifferentism, the idea in science that we can't know, all we can do is have a mathematical model that might be useful to make predictions and even technologically useful, but we can't know what the, that, the, that there is even a reality, which is basically the outlook of most of modern physics and certainly a lot of the well-known physicists uh, or scientists, people like Dawkins on the biology uh, physics side, uh, most of the leading scientists uh, will tell you that the universe is essentially random and that we're here by a certain accidental outcome. And uh, there's no point in looking for a purpose in the universe. Now, Einstein did not agree with that. He says explicitly, I think there's an objective reality. He said that in response to some of his closest personal friends, who almost all of whom disagreed with him. I mean, his own peer group, not just popular opinion as we normally think of it, but even the people he thought of, as, he himself thought of as experts of a certain kind, all disagreed with him. Many of them did come from a similar cultural background. He fought that every step of the way. And as Jason brought up last night, and there is going to be a, a discussion on Wednesday. They're going to renew the weekly report, and they're going to have a discussion of this Einstein principle. So I would recommend people, besides catching up on certain things, tuning into that. But he fought, Einstein fought that, and he fought politically. Einstein, uh, you know, fought against, uh, uh, for a certain uh, uh, common benefit for mankind. He fought for some of the same things that FDR fought for in terms of the, uh, his conception of the United Nations. Uh, for example, he was a supporter of the founding of the State of Israel, but he was very concerned about the rise of nationalism and the way the Palestinians were being treated in 1948 and 1949. So he, was, he, he had that from the very beginning. You know, there's a famous story. He was asked to be the president of Israel, and he turned it down, supposedly, because he wasn't poli that political. But he turned it down, really, because he was, not in, he was not attuned to the nationalism that was rising under those conditions. Now, to give you one idea where I think, because Lynn's method, his view of the human mind, his view of what this means for our relationship to the universe is in, what, is in certain ways very much typified by what Einstein did. And one good example is this question of simultaneity. Uh, because at the core of certainly special relativity, and certainly it continues into, into his later, and it's worth noting, Einstein was, a, was one of the founders of quantum theory. He's not, he wasn't just a one, what do you call it, a, a, a one horse pony or a one, you know, one, uh, one trick pony. Okay, he was relativity theory, he was one of the founders of quantum uh, effects, but at any rate, at the core of it is this issue of simultaneity. There is no universal time. There is no absolute time. Now that doesn't mean there isn't time, but there is no absolute time. Time is something that itself develops. It goes through changes. It doesn't just depend on the observer. There is a universal principle that governs time as a whole. And it's really that which leads to the problem of distances. You know, there is no fixed distance. There's no fixed measuring rod. Now, I think it's that, that can, his ability to come to that conception and use it is very close to what Lynn's rejection of the second thought law of thermodynamics, or the idea that there's such a thing as an equilibrium state in the universe, or in particular in human development. There is no equilibrium. There is no uh, uh, dissipation of the effects of what human beings can do into a random universe. 
a universe that's dissipating. That in fact, the, uh, as Diane referred to, human history is essentially the development of the human mind. Increasingly creative grasps of the nature of the universe that we live in, which changes the nature of the universe. We do things that are not only discoveries, but that never occurred before in the universe. We take the principles of the universe and cause effects that couldn't happen without the, without the human mind. I mean, one example, for example, the effort to control fusion energy. Now that's something that occurs in nature, it occurs in things like the sun, which are immense, a volume about a million times the size of the earth. We're talking about fusion in, a, let's say, a machine the size of this room, or maybe the length of a city block. So these are things that never occur in the universe without human intervention. So there is no equilibrium in, the uni in human history or in its relationship to the universe, just like there's no simultaneity in the universe. And I think these are very similar questions methodologically and in terms of what it means. And in, in a certain sense, you, you, when you look at the development of the human species, you have to look at a series of developments and how they interact in terms of what we need to do for the further development of the planet. There is no single outlook. There's the development of the human species and the ability, you know, one of the characteristics that Lynn has stressed is the fact that the human species has the capability of being immortal in the sense that the species needn't ever become extinct. Every other species will of necessity go extinct. Whether it takes a, a million years or a half a billion years, it has a limit. The human species doesn't really have a limit. And I think one of the things that's happened recently gives us an idea. When, when, when Einstein and some others made the discoveries they did, roughly around 1900, and this is what Russell was deployed against, this was the culmination of things that were worked on, anti-Euclidean geometry, Riemann, Gauss, and Leibniz, and so on and so forth. And Einstein was attuned to that, Kepler, Kuza, that there was a, a strand of thought that came with certain immense breakthroughs in 1900. We opened up an entirely new universe that we had no idea existed, the nuclear world. We re that, that we discovered the fact that there was, there's a power that existed in the universe that we had absolutely no idea. Now, the 20th century was pretty much a wreck because that was deployed against. And so, in a way, the whole question of time, equilibrium, then the, the issue then becomes the, there's no difference between Einstein's character and the development of his ideas. This is not to say that he's right about everything. That's not the point. He was right in the fundamentals. He was, he was a civil rights activist. He was a single integrated character. He was a proponent, as we've said, of classical uh, culture, music, and so on and so forth. So what Lynn is really posing, I think, with the, the Einstein issue, and I think it is important to know what Einstein did. I'm not saying leave aside all the details, but the, the essence of it for the moment is that he's saying this is the standard of creative intervention into mankind's relate, relationship to the universe. The individual like Einstein can change the entirety of the humanity's relationship to the universe. And you know, look at where we stand. We've learned a lot about the universe. I think there's a tremendous amount uh, that calls for us to go out into space that is not, you know, would mean a whole huge difference. We know that there, there are uh, supermassive objects at the center of most galaxies. We don't know much about galaxies. We don't know much about how galaxies formed, what the powers are that might be involved in galaxies. 
We don't know that much about cosmic radiation. At this point, we need a new Kepler for the solar system. Uh, Einstein has opened up some, uh, some of those areas. Much of, the tw of uh, those things were opened up by Einstein. Cosmology, as I said, the quantum, and so on and so forth. But we now have a solar system that has millions of asteroids, the Kuiper Belt, the Oort Cloud, a couple more planets, God knows how many more moons. The question of life. Life exists in places we never thought of, not only 100 years ago, but even 30 years ago. We didn't know that life existed in the middle of sulfur uh, flows in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at 700 degrees Fahrenheit. We didn't believe that life could exist there. So how, 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 how much life is there in the solar system or out into the galaxies? We now know that there's probably billions of planets. 20 years ago, we didn't know but that there were any outside of the solar system. So there's a huge amount to open up by, in, in fact, going back to the kind of standard of creativity that Einstein represents and that Lynn has represented uh, epistemologically as a physical economist uh, over these recent decades and up to the present. Next question. Hi, Diane and Dennis. Um, on, on the question of creativity, um, I think that a lot of people find it really challenging to, um, to kind of think about how does one become a genius. And um, this whole idea of worth and value in our society and how um, Mr. LaRouche has spoken about the, the greatest uh, you know, value we have is the child who's yet to become and the potential in that. Um, so the question is always, well, what is genius? What is required for genius? Are geniuses just born as a genius or is culture necessary? Um, I know I've seen um, examples of young people who've uh, accomplished some great, great things. I mean, there's lots of videos of four-year-olds who can play like some of the most challenging piano pieces. There's the 14-year-old uh, Quebec kid who I think discovered the fifth Mayan ruin from the just looking at the constellations. There was another 14-year-old that built a nuclear reactor apparently in his basement and you wonder, <laughs> you wonder, well, wow, these people must have like such a wonderful life ahead of them, but often what happens is it's rather disappointing they, they accomplish such great things, and then there's nothing that kind of goes at that level of creativity, um, and it, it kind of dies out almost completely, or it's, it's of a, a lower magnitude. So this, this question of then, uh, their, their genius was never fully realized. They accomplished something that is of a genius, but it was never fully realized within them. So there's something else that we need for that because they didn't continue a life that was comparable to a Beethoven, a Leibniz, or a Schiller. So it comes down again to, well, what does it require to understand Einstein, which we're constantly being asked to look into? Does it mean you have to have a, a degree in the field or you have to like put so many hours into um, these, this, the subject, these subjects? Or is it really um, something that we have access to universally as a thought experiment for a future potential that um, everyone has access to having a significant understanding in, even though it won't be the same? So thinking about it from this standpoint, it's not a matter of going to university so that you can acquire facts to a point where you're kind of like in a state of knowledge now. Um, you can say, I'm officially knowledgeable in this field. Now I can move on to something else because that's not what creativity is. You, it's not a fixed state. And I think that that's the problem is that we've been robbed. Actually, we don't need to acquire something, but we're born with something and we need to 
we need to, to feed that uh, by, sorry. My answer, is that Oh, it? yeah, okay. I mean, is that it? I just wanted to say further that because of how people are thinking um, with how you acquire knowledge, genius becomes an entropic state. Is that what I want, I'm, wanted to end on? Well, genius is not an entropic state. <laughs> um, you know, I've been reading some Unfortunately, there are fragments of letters of Einstein, but one which was very interesting is he says the more, he said, of course you need empirical evidence in physics, but the more advanced your theory is, the less you depend on empirical evidence, which means that it's the quality of thought. It's thought within your own mind. He also wrote, an extraordinary short paper on the relationship between society and the individual because it is the case, and this I think gets to the question of how is genius taught, um, that if an infant were left to its own devices and didn't die, um, probably that infant would not end up becoming a genius. Uh, they would be very concerned about where to get food and I don't know, maybe they'd learn how to sing or something, but it would be very primitive. If you think about how we live today, there's absolutely nothing, our food, our clothing, our houses, that we did not depend on someone else to produce. So this is very paradoxical that man, each individual, is a product of society. However, it is in the mind of the individual that a creative discovery is made. Uh, and I think just because we, anyway, what LaRouche, Mr. LaRouche said to us on the policy committee last week on the question of the discovery that your parents are liars uh, among a child, in a child is very important. Uh, because the idea of conforming to your, what your parents think you should think or society thinks you should, that's where genius is killed. And L Mr. LaRouche always talks about the example of the child observing uh, the, the parents having company. And the company goes to leave and everyone says, I'm so glad you came and we should do this again. It was wonderful to see you. The door is closed. And then they say, did you see what she was wearing? I can't believe. And so that you have this insight uh, of the fraud and the lying. And if you decide, you take a decision to not do that, to not be that way. And that is the way that you fight for your for genius. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Is that how it works? Go ahead. Hi. Okay. So, uh, in the process up to the Bronx Requiem concerts, oh no, I'm sorry, to the to the concerts in the Bronx, <laughs> we have been getting a response which gives sort of an indication of the political effect of our music work. Um, so in the Italian neighborhood, we've been getting an opening from people who are interested in studying up our classical culture atmosphere. Uh, people who a long time ago actually had Caruso sing in their back room. Uh, the Spanish communities have been inviting us to their carnivals to announce our concerts. Uh, the Muslim community has committed themselves to bringing their youth. And we found out that different community leaders, uh, when we came to them to tell them about the concert, they already knew about it or were committed to coming. Uh, furthermore, we have been going to offices of different politicians in the area with singing telegrams, singing Alleluia, Viva la Musica canons, uh, inviting these politicians to our concerts and asking them to circulate the concert uh, invitations. 
uh, something which has inspired them to promote our concerts and participate, and we have even been invited to sing at an event. Uh, the general response is that people see, uh, you know, they look at the situation between the street violence and the terrorism, and they uh, acknowledge that the situation is desperate. And then when we come and present the idea of freedom through beauty, uh, they respond very immediately. So my question is, what do you think we will be able to harvest out of this process? Um. Well, I, when you when you began talking, I, I was just reminded of something that uh, once happened. I was in a conversation with Mr. LaRouche, and uh, we were talking about Francois Rabelais. And for people who know the books, Gargantua and Panic Roll, um, they appear to be these very extended uh, episodes, uh, which are very funny. And they seem to be very wild and obscene and at the same time very insightful. And um, what he said to me was, well, you have to understand that this is a book about tragedy. That people, that era, that era of France, Rabelais, we're talking the 16th century, early 16th century, um, was tragic. It was a society which was dead ending. Uh, and that what he was doing was inventing a language, a capability, something like what Boccaccio and Petrarca did with Italian and in, in a different way, what Chaucer and then later Shakespeare did in English, a way to allow people to remove themselves from a state of tragedy. The United States is in a tragic circumstance, which a lot of people believe to be predestined effectively now or inevitable, it's so close, you can't do anything about it. The music gives people courage. It gives them, it connects them to something deeper in their own nature and which they resonate they, because you are allowing them to figure a way to, to find a way to place their own voice, you know, the voice of their, their true selves. Now, now this comes from what some work that was done, John's here and some others, who 30 years ago did some work with LaRouche on uh, a manual on tuning and registration, in which the contention was that the performance of classical music and the access to classical culture had been completely destroyed, or at least had made, been distorted, uh, because of the arbitrary raising of the pitch and the distortion uh, of the effect and the unity of effect of classical music. And, and this is an essential political war. And what we're doing in our performances of the Requiem uh, and the process, the choral process leading up to it, which is even more important, there's the people that are actually involved in participating and trying to sing it and now organizing for it. That, what that does is it returns people's voice because they know they can hear the braying and the gnawing and the gnashing of teeth that you get with a Trump or a Hillary or all this other stuff. People are aware of that, but they don't have a voice. So the Manhattan Project is uh, dedicated to this. And we have a few people here who, because of their work for decades, um, have a capability that doesn't exist anywhere, actually, maybe in the world, certainly not in the United States. So I think what's going to come out of this uh, is that you're going to have hundreds of people who will have gone through the process, thousands of people who will hear the performances, um, and some scores of people, young people in particular, that are going to want to do the same thing. And, and if you can get that, then you get the basis to create genius. Um, Mozart, in particular, in this case, is excellent for this, uh, and John or others may want to say something about it. Uh, and the Requiem is going to cause people to remember the crime of 9-11, but in a way which is elevated. They're elevated above it. 
They don't have to be drowned in despair by thinking about it. I think uh, we were told by one of our organizers in California that she's coming, she's a violinist, she's gonna come to the performance, and but she's bringing with her the badge and the shield of a firefighter from California, and she will be wearing this during the performance. Because he can't be there, but he wants his badge and his shield there, and he wants that given to the Brooklyn uh, Fire Department in particular, which lost 23 individuals. But the concept is that this is a living memorial and that the people who are performing are performing not only on behalf of the dead, no, they're performing on behalf of this newly found voice of the American people. That's what we're trying to do. We're introducing a new politics new political practice into America. It's one that Lynn has always insisted on, but we um, now know how to do it. And I think that's what's gonna come out of this. And I think we're going to find that manifest in hundreds, if not thousands of people joining our movement from this standpoint. And, and that's the beginning of the basis of a cultural renaissance. Thank you. Okay, let me just announce so we don't, just before you get up, we're, we're going to end in about 10 minutes. We're going to take these two, and then we have other discussion that we have that uh, we'll, we'll be conducting. So go ahead. Hi. <laughs> uh, yes, um, again, it is good to see uh, the LaRouche movement um, out in front, not afraid to uh, align itself with the Chinese. For a number of years, I engaged in an informal experiment of sorts um, where I distributed this paper, China Daily. Some of you might have seen me at an event or protest with this paper. And after, I don't know how many, five or six years, you know, I was made to feel like a pariah by the so-called left, who I began to understand their agents, most of them of Soros. And, you know, like Pacifica, WBAI, and so forth. And they hated me. They absolutely hated my guts um, for distributing China Daily, you know. And I'm not trying to say that China's perfect. Um, what is your orientation in terms of the history of the Chinese Communist Party? Obviously, you know, there's this legacy of, you know, Maoism, Stalinism, uh, and so forth. That is uh, the Chinese people themselves. I, it is not for me to dictate to them, right? Uh, but... I, I am fascinated with the fact that you, you know you guys have 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 this position. Thank you. Well, I think um, with China, and particularly right now, the important thing to look at is Confucius, and Leibniz, uh, who was supposed to be uh, civilizing China as a missionary, uh, discovered that Confucius had a great, great many similarities with Christianity, although Confucius was before Christ. And at one point even said that perhaps the Chinese should be coming to civilize Europe. Um, <clears throat> so what you have recently is a direction much more towards Confucianism, as opposed to these labels that people here like to put on things of communist and not communist and so on. I would also say that it's an important lesson because after the Cultural Revolution under Mao, which really was devastating, and Helga Tsepp LaRouche was one of the first, if not the first, Western journalists, um, actually sort of during the Cultural Revolution, as she described it, she sneaked into China on some kind of freight vessel and... Uh, had conversations with people and it was really devastating. And if people have seen the film from Mao to Mozart, the interviews with uh, one thing that sticks out in my mind, a, a violin teacher 
who, who during the Cultural Revolution was locked in a cell under a stairway where a leaky sewage pipe was dripping on him and he was only taken out to be beaten. Uh, and then Mao was out and, and Deng Xiaoping came back and basically said to himself at the age of 70, I have 20 years and made a commitment to transform the nation through classical culture, through science. I think it's very important to look at what's happened in China, and I'm by far not the greatest expert in our organization on this, uh, and there are people in this room who know more, but there was a decision made to reverse the depths of what was done to deprive people of the ability to think and be creative. And over two generations, what has occurred in China in terms of the number of scientists, of classical musicians, that they would make a decision to graduate 2,000 experts in nuclear fusion because they want to have a program for that. The United States could turn on a dime, and I think partly why the hostility toward anyone discussing or sharing what's actually happening in China is the obvious question for Americans would be if a nation that large that had had such an oppression as Mao could transform itself to be the leader in science, in economics, in cultural optimism, then why in the United States could we not do the same thing and, and exceed it based on certain principles of the American Revolution here? Okay, good. Uh, first quick, quick question, how much time do we have left for the very little? The person after you, we're gonna let him go, it's okay. Okay. Uh, but then we're gonna conclude with Muhammad, okay? So okay. Well, uh, I guess uh, being it that we have a, a protract, a, a limited amount of time, I'm going to cut the fat off of my question, which was originally going to be a, a slightly more expanded uh, thought and question I was going to de deliver. Maybe I can w deliver something a bit better next week. Okay, back to the point. Uh, <laughs> um, what I was recently uh, pondering is that um, th this capacity of, of truth, of, of what, upon what standard do we use to measure what is true? And in looking at what LaRouche has done, what Einstein has done, um, what Riemann has done, who is the connection that both Einstein and LaRouche have made you know, in common in their ability to forecast the future, is just that. They, they've made the point that it's when you can both see the future, forecast the future state, and then increase your power to act upon that future state that determines whether uh, your thoughts, your concepts that you generate have truth. And recently I was reading the, the writings of, of Riemann and there was a, an unpublished note that he made that uh, early in his life, he said that it was only when he read Leibniz's new essays on human understanding, which as he describes, uh, devastatingly destroyed the, uh, the thoughts or, or theories of John Locke on the nature of you know, the blank slate, the human soul, that he had the idea, the, the concept upon which he was able to then write his three core papers that provided the fruits for what you know, Einstein, Planck, LaRouche did. Um, and I was wondering, being it that today, most economists, most scientists have to almost accept the idea that there is no God, there is no soul uh, upon their, their embarking upon their profession. Um, how is it that we could just quickly uh, reaffirm how that is actually a, a precondition if you're going to make discoveries is an idea of what Leibniz had in opposition to Locke that, in fact, there, we are not a blank slate as Locke protested or contested, but rather that there's something that is already there to be stimulated, awakened, and that has something to do with the entirety of creation. Um, so that, sorry if that was a little bit longer than I anticipated. We can do that. Riemann's four pages, his habilitation dissertation, four of the most brilliant pages ever written in human history. And he makes it very clear you must, in how to have true science, destroy the domain of mathematics and enter the domain of what he calls physics but it's the physics that Einstein uh, invented uh, and that Lynn has uh, also advanced. Of course, Lynn talked about how at the age of 26, I believe he, in, or in 1952, 51, 52, Lynn was a little bit older, uh, had his own uh, breakthroughs 
largely because of his considerations of the work of Bernard Riemann. But you mentioned something about Locke and uh, Leibniz. And I'll only say this. The New Essays on the Human Understanding is a very important work because it is one of the most important anti-slavery tracts ever written. Locke was the head of the Royal Africa Company. He was one of the founders of the Royal Africa Company uh, and was a major proponent and profiteer of the slave trade, which follows from his epistemology. Leibniz, on the other hand, was one of the core founders of the United States, which follows from his epistemology. And the easiest or greatest direct access people can have would be to take a look at the habilitation dissertation. Many people know that the youth movement of the LaRouche uh, organization was largely based upon a reading of that and other works by Kepler and others. Uh, this is something that we can take up. I think it's not a, a bad thing to do that people add this in since they're going to be reading Einstein anyway. Um, to take a look at that paper and people like Phil and others can help people through it. I think that's enough for us to just reference here. And I think what's important is to understand that the domain of politics, science, and music is one domain. And economics is the effect of that unified domain. Yeah, go ahead. You say it? Yeah. Wait, I just have something. Um, I, I... I think it doesn't quite work the way that you're saying or thinking about it. And I think the question is uh, the question of the future. And um, it would be good to rethink it and think from that standpoint, because it's not relationships between people who had opposing views. There's a, a stronger question, which is the question of the future. Do you know the future? How does one know the future? I'll leave it at that. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is space and time. You parents that the space and time is wrong, but my opinion, I believe space and time is exist because space is uh, related by the observation and time is unique, how we think out there. And time is unique. Is innate? Uh, unique. Yeah. Is unique? Yeah. Time unique. is a unit? Oh. Unix man. Uh, you better talk about it. This is a musical question. It's not a, <laughs> it's a musical opening question. and not finish. It's just. No, no, no. Really, no. It's, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, actually, uh, Dennis and I have another idea, but I would just. Did you see the discussion last night from Jason Ross? Okay. Because he used the example, and, and this is where I think Einstein saying that there's a, there's a certain amount of empirical evidence, but the more advanced your theory is, it's not. Einstein's experiments were in his mind. Um, and the example used was a train that is struck by lightning at both ends. So the observer who's looking at the train with lightning striking both ends sees the lightning strikes as occurring at the same time. The passenger on the train, which is moving at a very high speed in a particular direction, perceives that the lightning at the front of the train strikes a little bit before the lightning at the back of the train. So the question is, when did the lightning can you pinpoint when the lightning struck? And I would say it is not absolute. But, but uh, light is a different, uh, different yeah. things. Like in space and time, but light yeah, is but different. Yeah, but let different. me ask you this. What time did the lightning strike? 
when I observation the, uh, this time? Well, how do you explain that for one observer it occurred in one instant and for another observer it occurred at two different times? Somebody, I observed this time, this is my uh, unique time. And I'm, I saw the next one and this one for next time. <laughs> but I cannot explain <laughs> because I have a, uh, in short, I have, I'm not very expert in English. I think what Einstein was demonstrating is that the universe doesn't work in that way. And there's not such a thing as time that's chopped up in little pieces and things occur at equidistant points or points on this line of time. There is something related to cause. And in fact, your mind does not work in this way either. And you'll see when you think about it. And the musical, I don't know, I have many different musical ideas, but I think I'll, I'll leave it for that. But it's worth reflecting of this example that Einstein used. Bang, next question. I think it's good to leave things at that moment of tension. <laughs> All right, so that's going to conclude it for this week. Oh, wait, we do have something else. Excuse me, you can't conclude yet. Yeah, not all, Fred, are we? Uh, Lynn? Yeah, to do it from right here. Okay. Keep it on, this is for... Yes, okay. So on behalf of the Manhattan Project, and I think really our entire uh, U.S. organization, I wish to extend a very, very happy 75th anniversary to our colleague, uh, birthday, I'm sorry, birthday, uh, anniversary of, of his birth to our colleague, uh, Jacques Cheminade, who heads up. <laughs> the um, LaRouche movement in France and, um, and is running for president of that country. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> there's a very special connection because Jacques was actually recruited here in Manhattan as a young diplomat working at the French mission and we met him distributing the newspaper on the streets of Manhattan. And he came to our offices in Manhattan and got recruited to this movement and uh, went on to head up and really build our organization in France and help to build the organization in Europe as a whole. And so, we want to extend this really also in the spirit. We will be holding, of course, the concert, the, Requ the Mozart Requiem Memorial Concerts very soon over the September 11th uh, four-day uh, period. And as you know, the, we have as the, the symbol that was chosen by the foundation on the poster for the concerts is the teardrop 9-11 monument which was given to the United States by Russia in dedication to the struggle against international terrorism. And this monument stands in parallel with the World Trade Center towers on one side and on the other side the Statue of Liberty. And the Statue of Liberty, of course, was donated to the United States by France in the aftermath of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. And the idea of that was very much the same idea, breaking the chains of slavery. So this is the spirit in which we in the United States, in unity with you in France, are fighting today to end the scourge of terrorism 
and mental slavery, which afflicts so much the world's population. And we are fighting, of course, for a true human creative identity of every person on this planet and the yet unborn generations. So it is in that spirit that we thank you, Jacques, for your 75 years of a gift to us and to all of humanity. And we wish you a very, very happy birthday.